Okay, good morning uh, or good afternoon. Uh, thanks for coming to my talk. I'm going to talk a little bit about the impact of early death on phenotypically plastic robots uh, that evolve in changing environments. So a little bit of motivation. Uh, we know that behavior emerges from the interaction between uh, the brain, the body, and the environment. Uh, and when it comes to the environment, uh, this can happen in different ways. So one can be the direct interaction of the environment with a phenotype, um, and this could result in a particular behavior. Um, but you can also have the environment have an influence uh, by, by making selection pressure throughout generations uh, and then the pressure for particular traits to evolve. And one third way is regulation. So the environment is acting upon a genotypic structure and defining which portions of this genotypic structure are going to be expressed or not. Uh, given environmental conditions. And despite the huge importance of the environment to determine what behavior and what life's going to be, uh, very little research is done about it. Um, and a lot of the research is focused on the phenotype, but it, mostly even in the brain. So uh, what I'm going to present has to do with regulation, so the influence of the environment uh, and what regulation can do. I have a quote here saying that an amazing number of 95% of DNA does not code for any protein. Part of it is responsible um, for regulation. Of course, there's part of it that's also unknown. Uh, the, the use of it is unknown, but a lot of it is responsible for regulation. And in fact, the more uh, genomically complex an organism, the larger the percentage of its DNA devoted to environmental regulation. So something super fundamental in nature uh, for complexity, and still uh, we are not looking at it. So I, if, if this is so important in nature and we, um, and we get inspiration from nature, we might have to look into regulation if we desire to obtain real complex robots, real complex behavior, uh, behavior and artificial life, uh, we might need regulation. And when it comes to environmental regulation, there are a few possibilities. Uh, you can have regulation change in physiological dynamics of an individual, or uh, you could have phenotypic plasticity, meaning that uh, something uh, uh, prominent in your phenotype is going to change, could be either in your body, in your brain, although of course these are, these are both related, but that could be one way of categorizing it, uh, etc. And we are focusing here in phenotypic plasticity. Uh, some examples would be a separate vertebrate species that suffer from color change in different seasons. So that's one example of how to have your phenotype changing. Um, Passerine birds that change the musculature to cope with winter, uh, etc. For us, we uh, made a, a relatively simple abstraction of it. Uh, so here on the left, we have what we call the baseline, and on the right, what we call plastic coding, and this is result of a previous work um, published in 2020. Uh, that we did publish in 2020. And the difference between baseline and plastic coding, so it's the same in coding, except uh, that in the baseline, the plasticity capacity is off. So there's no phenotypic plasticity taking place based on, uh, um, based on environmental regulation or through environmental regulation. Uh, so what happens here, you have this particular portion of the genetic material and the whole portion gets expressed uh, regardless the environmental condition the robot finds itself in. So you see here that it ends up with the same body and the same brain. Uh, on the other hand, uh, plastic coding would uh, allows to have the environment, the environmental conditions selecting different portions of this DNA structure of, of this genetic material to be expressed depending on the environmental condition. So you can end up with a different body uh, and a different brain to control this body. Uh, and this was used 
in a, a seasonal environmental condition. So uh, the idea that you have this environment that is changing throughout the lifetime of a robot. Uh, and yeah, you could uh, make an analogy with seasons, for instance. And what we did have was a plain environment and a tilted environment, so similar to uh, like a, a flat floor and a, a hill, so to say, to be climbed. Um, and these robots could live 50 seconds in each one of these environments. So 50 seconds of its life were lived in the flat terrain and the other 50 seconds in the tilted environment and so on. So in this previous work, what we did show is that there is a benefit. So uh, uh, you do obtain more adaptable robots. So here, what we see in this red line is how good these robots were when they did not have to cope with seasonal changes and plasticity was not necessary. Uh, and then the green box here, so here's the example for the flat environment. And the green box is the baseline. So the one that the DNA structure that uh, doesn't have um, capacity for phenotypic plasticity and the dark green one uh, is plastic coating, the one with capacity for phenotypic plasticity. And we see uh, an improvement in the adaptation of the robot. So you get better robots. Uh, if you endow them with the capacity to adapt to different environments. But there was a, a limitation of, uh, uh, um, in, in this previous study. So the idea is that robots could die at any moment. Uh, I mean, they could not die at any moment. Um, so they, they would go through the first season, which was plain. And we postulated that they would get to the second season, which is this, uh, the tilted season. Um, and in a more realistic scenario, there's no guarantee that this would happen. You could have robots uh, simply dying in the first season for any reason, uh, and they would never have the chance to arrive to the second season. So we were curious, like, uh, what would happen if we made this more realistic? So if we allowed these robots to die in the first season, uh, what kind of effects would this have uh, on the on selection pressure, uh, on the, the emerging traits that these robots would have, uh, both behaviorally and phenotypically? So we made an alternative uh, experimental setup. So what we see here is like a, now what we are calling baseline experiment is this previous work that we just talked about. So the one in which they could, uh, there was no early death, that's what we're calling it early death, that you can die early um, uh, in the first season, as opposed to wait into the second season to possibly die. Um, so here we had a plane and the tilted, and this was a given, but now we have two uh, alternative experiments, one called plane death experiment and the other called tilted death experiment. Um, and for, for both these cases, robots can die in the previous season, but we have two uh, orders. So one, in one case, the plane season happens first and the robots can die in it. And then later the tilted season comes and in the second one, the tilted season comes first, robots can die in it, and then the plain season comes. Uh, all right, so a little bit of the system we're working with, we work with modular robots um, based on the RoboGen uh, framework. As for the controller, we work with CPGs, um, and also the parameters of these CPGs, which are oscillators, are also uh, defined through evolution. And here we have this input connections that are the sensors that may uh, perturb these oscillations. So the encoding uh, we work with is an L system. And it's a, an L system is a system of rewriting, the rewriting of rules and the ideas that we start with uh, uh, something very simple, like one symbol, and the symbol is called the axiom. Here we have a didactical example. Um, and then you have 
uh, replaceable symbols and non-replaceable symbols. And for the replaceable symbols, you have what's called production rows, which is just each, each production row is just a string uh, full of other symbols that can be replaceable or not. And the idea is that you grow from this axiom, which is just one symbol, into a more complex string through the interaction of this production rows. So uh, how we implemented plasticity here was what before we had for each replaceable symbol, um, there was just one production row, like one, one flavor of production row. So what we did was duplicate in this production row. So for instance, here, X, Y, and Z had only one type. And now we have two X's, two Y's, and two Z's. Uh, and then there's this Boolean clause here that's going to be reading environmental conditions. For instance, is this environment that I, I find myself right now inclined or not? Something you could tell with an IMU sensor. Uh, if, it, if it happens to be inclined, well, I'm going to activate the first clause, otherwise I'm going to activate the second clause. Uh, so in this case here, assuming that the environment was inclined for X, we would get the first flavor of the gene. Uh, the, the, for the Y, we would get the second flavor. The Z, we would get the first flavor. And here would be the uh, how the P uh, uh, group of production rules looks after the regulation. And it looks just like it looked before, right? So before you had one flavor, now with classical, then you have two flavors, but after you regulate it, you end up with just one flavor. So you can do the rest of the process uh, exactly like before, just do the early development with uh, basically just a rewriting of the L system and then apply the late development, which is the mapping function. Uh, okay, the fitness is speed. And we remember we have two seasons in this case. So first we uh, calculate the speed in the first season. Then we do have the, uh, the early selection, also at the early depth selection. Um, and the early depth selection will be based on the pool of uh, offspring and parents. So basically we're just going to order everyone that's in the pool um, and everyone that's the higher you are at the, the rank, the greater chances you're going to have to survive. Then we calculate the second, uh, the speed in the second season for everyone that survived here. And then at the end, uh, we uh, we treat it as a multi-objective search. So we have two objectives, one for the first season and one for the second season. Uh, and what we do is counting the number of dominated individuals using the concept uh, of dominance. And so the higher the number of individuals that uh, an individual has dominated, the higher its fitness. Uh, one thing important here is that the probability is of survival uh, or the amount of individuals who are going to survive in the early death selection is not fixed. Uh, so you have here, uh, its probability is based on the ranking. Um, and the probability will depend on, the, um, the probability will be compared to something drawn from a random uh, distribution, uniformly distributed. Um, so this means that you could have a varying number of individuals from the offspring surviving in each one of these uh, generations. So the results that we see, uh, the first thing we're, we're going to look at here is this first plot this, uh, with the lines. And the green one is the baseline. So plus the coding, just like it was in the original paper, uh, in which robots can not early die. So they can, uh, we postulate that they go through both uh, seasons. The orange one is the one that the playing season comes first and they can die. And the uh, blue one is the one that the tilted comes first and they can die. So what we see here comparing the baseline, which is the green uh, with the orange is that there's an earlier exploitation 
and then we're, we're going to see exactly what they're exploiting later, but we find better results earlier, basically. Uh, when you, and then when you compare them to at the end, there is no difference. So here we have uh, uh, these box plots are just drilling down uh, particular generations here from this line plot. So if you look at generation 50, this is the box. Plot. Those are the box plots for generation 50. And those are the box plots for generation 200. Uh, there's no, I mean, it's a little bit higher here, but there's no significant difference between them at the end. Uh, but if you compare, you, you see here that the, it's growing much faster. And when you compare here at the most extreme points, um, which is generation 50, there is a significant difference. So, uh, well, that, that does make sense. That we are ma we are making more selection pressure for the first environment, uh, and it is becoming better in the first environment. Of course, ideally, uh, we would desire not to have any loss for the second season, right? Uh, we were making more pressure for the second season. Now you can you can die um, right away, and we would like this not to have any effect on the second. But of course, this comes with a cost. So if you look down here. Uh, we have the performance on the tilted season, and you see that the orange line really dropped a lot. And we make it uh, uh, with the lines because it's scaled, it's not so obvious, uh, or it is less obvious. But when you look at the boxes, you see that there's a dramatic loss of performance. So, of course, it did not come with a cost. There was degradation for the second season, all this uh, pressure in the first season. Now, uh, if you look at the other experiment, tilted uh, comes first, the blue one. There is degradation in the second season. Just remember that if, if tilted comes first and then the plane comes later. And then we see here, there is a degradation, which you, uh, does make sense. But there was no gain. So you compare the blue line with the green line, there's no improvement uh, or no earlier exploitation of anything like we did see. Uh, with the case in which the plane comes first. Um, and that's interesting, it's curious. Yeah, there might be an explanation. So what we know from before um, is that when you have to cope with different environmental changes, um, there's a stronger selection pressure for the, the, the environmental uh, condition. Um, that is somehow more general or more difficult. So the tilted environment is a more difficult task um, because you have to climb as opposed to just walk on a locomote on a straight floor. Uh, and also if you do a robustness test, uh, we saw this in other studies. So if you evolve a robot in the plane floor and you put it on the tilted, it's gonna do quite bad, but if you, take a robot that was evolved on the plane floor and you put it on the tilted, it kind of does okay. So the strategy that emerges from the tilted floor uh, is more general to also be used in the tilted, uh, sorry, in, in the plane floor. Um, and this might be one of the reasons why it makes Mars a stronger selection pressure. And because it does a stronger, it has a stronger selection pressure, there's less in uh, there's less space for improvement in the tilted, uh, as opposed to having uh, space for improvement in the plane. So this could be one possible explanation of why in the plane we see this early exploitation and we do not see the same in the tilted. So what was this exploitation? Well, what we knew from previous studies as well is that. Um, the, the type of selection pressure that happens in the tilted uh, when compared to the plane is that, uh, um, so what, what kind of traits are being pressed for? Well, robots become smaller uh, in the tilted and a little bit more proportional, sometimes even with more limbs. Uh, also, they do not roll. In the, in the plane floor, it's often to, to uh, obtain large snakes that just roll um, recklessly around. Uh, 
But if you do this on the tilted environment, that can be quite tricky uh, to just move so much, to just be so large, having so many joints and any small, uh, in any step wrong that you take, you might just easily fall down the hill just with the help of gravity. So evolution becomes, or decides, so to say, uh, to be more conservative in this sense, making smaller robots that roll and, and sometimes try to kind of walk uh, as opposed to just roll and uh, grow big and roll. So what we see here is uh, is exactly in this sense. So size is being exploited earlier. So we saw before the fitness growing uh, earlier in the generations, and exactly in these generations we see size, the size of the robots also growing, and the proportion decreasing, uh, and also the balance. So because if you balance uh, is a measurement of how steady the head of a robot is. And if you're rolling, you have a very low balance. And that's what we see here, the balance is becoming lower, meaning these robots are turning into snakes that roll earlier. Um, yeah, and that does make sense. Uh, so let's take a look a look and how they survived. So uh, in the, remember that in the early death, uh, part of the population can die uh, from what happens in the first season. So here we have the number of survivors, and this is accounting only for the offspring, uh, because only the offspring is uh, subject to, to the early death. The parents have already gone through the stage of uh, going through the two seasons, and they uh, still account to make selection pressure uh, to change the selection pressures uh, serving as a reference to the offspring but only the offspring are at that stage that okay I might die or not uh, what we see here is that the number of survivor survivors decreases uh, up to generation 100 and one interpretation for that could be that it gets harder and harder for the offspring uh, to be at the top of the rank. So let's uh, remember what the rank is about. So we order every robot in the rank. And this includes not only uh, the offspring, but the whole pool of parents and uh, offspring. And because uh, uh, remember that this probability here is not uh, fixed, so a varying number of individuals can survive uh, in each generation. And this varying number is what is going down. Uh, what can be happening here is that in the beginning, the, uh, the population is random, right? So robots are not that good. And uh, even if you make a new offspring and this offspring, uh, because through mutation, you're, you're exploring, right? So there's always a risk of bumping into something that's a bad solution. But the population has just uh, been created, right? It's, it's random. So if the offspring's bad, well, uh, it won't be that much different from the parents. It won't be that much worse because the parents are also bad. Uh, but as generation uh, evolution progresses, selection pressure takes place, takes place, it becomes, the parents become better and better and it becomes harder and harder for the, uh, for the offspring to be um, better than the parents or not to be worse significantly worse than the parents. Uh, and if this, is if this happens, then there's a greater chance that the, the, uh, the offspring will be lower in the rank at the beginning. And, because, and if the parents are higher, they have higher probability, and then they, uh, the, a lot of these individuals will not be selected. A lot of these uh, offspring individuals will not be selected to survive in the early selection. Note uh, that, uh, the parents are making pressure on the rank, uh, but they would not be selected to the rank. Uh, otherwise, this number would be uh, static. They are just making pressure by being in the rank, but we don't account them as survivors. Then this number of survivors keep on going down. They keep on going down up to generation 100, and then it plateaus 
Uh, one possible interpretation to it might be related to the fact that the fitness also plateaus here. So uh, the search has converged around generation 100. Uh, what, what could be is that when you get to this point, the, the, the population has converged, everyone is very similar to each other, and there's a very little chance there's very little chance that the offspring would be that different from the parents uh, uh, and resulting in being much lower in the rank. Uh, this would happen much less often, and this is why the number of survivors, the survivors stabilizes. Uh, so my conclusion, the traits fit for the environmental conditions that happen first, so earlier uh, throughout the lifetime of a robot, are favored. Uh, and what one possible interpretation to that would be that there are more chances that uh, these robots will go through the first stage, uh, its first stage of life, than through the first and the later stages of life. And because of this, it makes more sense that uh, these earlier stages are uh, more important and make a higher pressure because the traits for these stages are more relevant and the ones you will need the most. Once you don't know if you're getting to the next stages. Um, early, and then in practice, early death improves the efficiency of the evolutionary process for these earlier environmental conditions, but of course, uh, it comes with a dramatic loss of performers in the later environmental conditions. Okay, thank you. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it and please let me know if you have any questions.